We're looking here at Argoff, the dwarf thief, and he is on a mission. He's got seven days in which to travel across this wilderness and deliver a holy symbol to a cleric who is waiting for him so they can continue on with the next portion of the adventure. He's got two ways to get this holy symbol to the cleric. One is just to find the cleric. The other way, the more likely way, is to, before his rations run out, hire a, a mercenary to uh, locate the cleric with him. The peoples of the land know where this cleric is hiding out and will, for the right price, tell Argoff and lead Argoff there. This is the uh, play portion of the solo arc. PG tutorial series that I've been running. You do not need to have watched the first two videos in that series to watch this one. It's going to be self-contained, but uh, if you want to know the background of how I came up with the story and how I'm using the map here and why I've decided on the basic fantasy rule set to run this, you can look at the earlier videos. There are links below. Otherwise, this is basically just going to be a demo of the first few mm, hours or maybe day of Argoff's travels and how we figure out where he's going and who he's encountering and what he needs to do to get uh, to fulfill his mission of taking this holy symbol to its rightful owner. As to the symbol, I think I've decided that I want to I want to figure out exactly what the symbol is, and I'm going to do it by using this dictionary of symbols. There's not really a great way to do this without using a computer with a random number generation between one and I think there's about 1200 pages in the book, but I don't want to do that. So I'm going to be imprecise and simply roll some d10s until I get a number that is within range um, up to four d10s. So we'll see that um, we roll a four and we roll a seven, we roll eight, 478, so it's gotta be on page 478. Yes, I know that is not um, in any way scientific, but that's how, I'm, that's how I'm doing it. So 478, and we will find something about our symbol, and let's see what we get. All right, it's a headdress. This is a word which can mean both what one puts on one's head and also the way in which the head or rather the hair is dressed. A ceremonial headdress will be different from others and he or she who wears it will tend to partake of a magic power like that imparted by a crown. According to its shape, it will symbolize harmony with earth, aspiration toward heaven, or the accretion to its wearer of heavenly powers. Interesting. Square, pointed, round, tall, or flat. It has been claimed that wearing a hat could mean that the part played by the hair as recipient of celestial influences was at an end, and even that the ultimate goal of the initiatory quest had been reached. However, reaching that goal does not stop. Rather, it intensifies its mediatory function. The tips of the three-cornered hat, like the spikes on a crown and like the hair itself, are conceived as images of the sun's rays. As a head covering, the hat also symbolizes the head and thought. It is, once again, a symbol of the identity. Well, interesting, interesting. So our thief has stolen a headdress from someone. It is a magical headdress, and it is going to symbolize, let's see, it could be square, pointed, round, tall, or flat. Um, let's see what it is. Square, pointed, round, tall, or flat. It is pointed. It is a pointed headdress, and perhaps it is a crown in that regard, and it will um, symbolize an aspiration toward heaven, and that makes sense because we know he's delivering it to this cleric, and we also know now that this symbolizes perhaps that Part of the quest has already been fulfilled, so maybe our thief has stolen this um, for the good, that uh, perhaps he has stolen it back for the cleric. I think I said in um, earlier thoughts about this adventure in a different video that one possibility would be not that he is taking something he stole and delivering it to somebody um, who wants it 
for themselves as an acquisition from someone else, but rather that he has stolen it back for the cleric. And I think this is telling me this, uh, the symbol of what it actually is, is telling me that this is the case. So our thief is um, a good thief and he has stolen back this magical headdress to return it to the cleric and he is traveling through the land to fulfill the um, next portion of his quest. Argoff, the dwarf thief, has been resting in the ruins here that's labeled number three and he is uh, setting out for the next day. He's got seven days worth of rations and I will talk briefly about how we're going to be keeping track of this. Movement is, uh, as I discussed uh, elsewhere, I'll just review it quickly here, movement is going to be determined by two die rolls. And one is going to be for direction, and that's the d6, and one will be for not so much distance, but terrain. So we are using this map to give us the suggestion of what the terrain is. We are not uh, traveling necessarily in this world. This is really a pen and paper experience that we're having, but this is going to suggest the new terrain types to me. Additionally, we are talking about supply, and the uh, notion of using a ration or being out of supply will have to do with if we end our movement in one of these existing structures, on one of these roads or paths, or in the presence of actually this is um, the dark here is a river that will allow us to fish, the signal of a deer here it will allow us to hunt. We would not be out of supply. We would not need to consume any of our rations. But absent that, we will be consuming a ration, and uh, we only have rations for seven days. I've got a few other housekeeping things to get out of the way, and then we're going to start out. How I'm keeping track of the weather is based on an idea from this solo wargaming guide and I've modified it a bit but what I'll be doing at the at the outset is to roll two d6s to see where on this chart I land in terms of what the weather is and then every new day I will roll again one d6 and based on that roll I'll either move up or down on the chart and this will determine what the weather is. I've sketched out some weather impacts here uh, so for example if it's stormy that would have a line of sight impact it might take me more time to do something and there would be no ranged um, attack possible. Now, I don't even know if this is going to come into play because, for example, I don't have a ranged weapon right now, but this is just a suggestion of something and may or may not come into play. But I like to sketch out a little bit here and also a little bit of what the weather possibly might be. In terms of keeping track of the time, it's going to be a basic, uh, we're going to start out at dawn and I've divided up the time here and I'll be rolling a D8 for every section of action that happens. And again, it's very fluid. You'll see how it plays out. But um, after there's a travel portion, or I should say when there's a travel portion, I'll do a roll here to see how long that has taken to put me into a segment of the day or the night. And I don't have any effects sketched out here. That's going to be evolving as the adventure progresses. During the night, I will be able to rest and regain a health point per the basic fantasy rules. I've decided this is the ration chart. I was mapping out how the rations were going to be consumed. Uh, I've got seven days worth of rations. I'm not going to do that. It's getting to be too much detail and I know that I'll forget to do it while I'm filming. So simply during the course of the day, uh, one ration will be consumed. And if I am within supply line, as discussed earlier, then I won't be consuming the ration. Again, not really sure how that will be playing out in terms of the impact on what, what happens. In terms of encounters and how they happen, I'm going to go to this DM guide from 3.5, and I'll be rolling on this chart here. This is the uh, random room contents chart that I am modifying here. It's a D100 chart and it will indicate uh, per what it is meant to do, it's going to indicate what's in a dungeon room. But I'm modifying this. So for example, if I roll on um, for if I roll a 48, I say monster features and trap, this will 
give me a direction for how much I describe in terms of the environment, whether or not I'm rolling to have an encounter on the encounter table I already um, presented to you or not. Features only will be something that will be generated out of the environment. Um, hidden treasure only, the same thing. This is just a rough guide uh, so that it gives me some variability in terms of not only the likelihood of having an encounter, but what that encounter is. Because of course, not every encounter is simply going to be a monster that you fight, at least not in the way that I'm doing this here. And this is going to be evolving organically, obviously, as we go. And then the final point is, as I've thought about it, I changed up something on the encounters chart that I made because the I wanted, um, in the clear, I want there to be something more than just the possibility of these two elementals coming in. So I've got um, an NPC possibility with a role there, and I've also got something called that I'm calling Other Hazards. And this is going to be from some material that I found. This is an old, um, from Warhammer Quest roleplay book by uh, Andy Jones. This is a hazards table that I found that it seems to be mostly environmental. I don't know how much this will play in because, for example, you could get lightning, and if I got lightning on a day that it was clear, that might not make sense. But it's, uh, it's something that I found possibly um, suggestive in a way that could help advance the story. So I'm going to, I'm going to maybe use this and the way I would get to that is through this role. It might not work, it might. And I also found some pre-generated NPCs from Basic Fantasy, so I've got that printed out and if I encounter an NPC in this role, I'll bring that one in and we'll see how it goes. So that concludes the bookkeeping portion and now we're going to set out on the actual journey. I did some random rolling, mostly in the Tome of Adventure Design, because I wanted to just do a brief description of where Argoff is standing in the middle of the map in the ruins. And I did a time lapse of it. I'm having difficulty uploading it, so I don't know if that will actually be part of the video, but you'll have to take my word for it that uh, what I rolled for here when I was trying to get a description of these ruins was a partially collapsed manor prison, which didn't really necessarily fit. I got two different things that suggested I was in the ruins of a spire that, um, or a spherical area um, that is now a ruin, and that what this used to be in the past was a house for thieves, uh, thieves, smugglers, and passers-by. I'm in the hallway, and then I rolled on my own weather, which was clear, and uh, there's a hint of early morning fog and a sort of slight acrid or decaying smell in the air. That immediately suggested this story to me, and the story is now uh, coming on as a more of an overarching idea and background. So I wrote, a hint of the rising sun creeps through the stone ruins of the manor in which Argoff has spent the night. He has camped amid the broken spire of a once great thieves' hideout, now known throughout the land as a haven for the thieves of light. Thieves of light, I have decided, uh, per what I was discussing earlier, that I Argoff is really returning, he has stolen and is returning this magical symbol, this magical crown to the cleric. So he is a thief of light. This band of do-good warriors and cast-offs pledged their lives to all fellow citizens, however they could. After the rise of the evil wizard Karloff, <laughs> maybe I'll change that name, of the north, this, uh, this manor house was lain to rubble. The day dawns clear with only a hint of fog from last night's storm. There is the slight smell of decay in the air as Argoff surveys the crumbling ruins of the good thieves' den. So immediately, what I've got here now on, on top of as a framework for the very basic structure that you saw me develop with my thief in the wilderness. I apologize for the light here. It, it is early morning and I don't have all the lights on yet. But you could see up top, this was the original structure. I had some thief with a holy symbol traveling through the wilderness trying to get to the temple. What, what this has now become, it is becoming a story of my thief 
alone, uh, separated from his band of thieves of light, thieves that do good in the world and try to steal things to rectify uh, problems that have happened before. He is taking this holy symbol to the cleric. He has found himself, he's woken up in these ruins here, and this is simply suggested by his place on the middle of my outdoor survival map, because I'm going to be rolling for movement here, so I wanted to start him out in the middle, this ruin in the forest, and um, he is going to, I think before he actually goes anywhere, I think he's going to look around. And in order to look around, we are faced with the very first roll on some form of yes or no table. I'm showing you one here from the ABS solo game engine. This is actually a chart that shows you how to use different types of dice. Uh, this is by Ken Wickham. I've also got my just general percentile one, and I've got a bunch of others that I can't find right now. I'll show them to you during the course of this video. There's lots of lots of different options here, obviously, and they're, on the one hand, so simple. On the other hand, they can be very complicated because this can be, I think, the place where people start to stop what they're doing if um, they are rolling on something and then uh, they get a yes, and then, well, then what? And then they get a no, and then it's can get it can get difficult. However, um, I'm going to go with this for right now. We got the 3D6 going, so I'm going to go with this chart, and I'm going to roll to see, first of all, uh, this, it, are there any, is, is there anything left behind here worth taking? He's looking around these, the ruins of this hallway of this old Thieves' Den manor, and um, it has been obviously heavily looted over the years, so I would say that um, it is... Very unlikely that there will be something here, but we'll do our roll and we'll see. And the way this works is we're going to roll our 3d6, but we're going to take this modifier of minus 3 since I think it's very unlikely that we'll find anything. But we roll a 9, we roll a 10, that brings us down to a 7. And what does this mean? No, um, not only uh, we were just, just, uh, just a one away from getting out of this, but not only is there nothing here, but our pawing through the rubble has disturbed something, and this something is not going to be something good. Given where we are in this ruin that is both inside and outside, what we find is probably some type of a plant situation here growing amid the rocks. And what do we, what type of plant is this? Well, it's actually a flower, and this flower see if we can't quite see this here. This flower will attract a particular predator into the area as a protective device, possibly a subtle one like small venomous snakes. So this uh, flower is going to signal to us that there are there's an increased likelihood of a predator here, of an encounter here, and so that will tell me that um, we need next to roll on our encounter table. Now, our encounter table for the uh, ruins that we are in. So I readjusted here. So the typically we roll a 30% chance of finding something in the ruins, but because this flower is something that attracts things, I'm going to say that it's a 50% chance of attracting something, and we rolled within that. So actually that did make the difference here because we rolled a 32. So we have encountered something. Now let me show you how the um, encounter is going to work. I mentioned that I am working with this encounter table from 3.5. What I'm doing here, it's another D100. This is a modified table because we're not in a dungeon, but I'm going to do a modified D100, and uh, or I should say a modified table here, following this indicator. And the reason that I'm doing this is to give myself the possibility I know there's going to be an encounter. It doesn't necessarily only ever have to be a monster. And so let's see, first of all, what we roll on there. We got a 69, and we get features only. So in fact, we're going to have, we're going to encounter this 
this area a little bit more, but the way we're going to do that is through features only. And here I need to figure out where I can get some randomized tables to give me some features of this environment, which is a ruin. To get something, I'm going to go to this classic dungeon design guide and roll on some tables here. This is the, these are the dungeon dressing tables, features of curiosity. There's, there's three of them and uh, I'm going to roll, I'll, I'll roll on maybe all of them and we'll see what we get. First, we got a 40. Uh, I don't know if you could see that roll, but it was a 40. This is a water clock. So let's make a note um, of that. Table two will give us, get a better roll on the camera. Can't seem to get it on the camera here. A 28. Manacles bolted to a wall. So we're in a ruin. There might not be uh, an actual wall. Maybe we'll be able to get these manacles. We'll see. Let me note that down. And see what else one more we got one more table so why not we'll see if we can find one more thing here and that is a 61 61 is going to be uh, more rolls so I think we will just pass on that so we've got uh, we found a water clock or possibly found a water clock and some manacles that are allegedly bolted to a wall, but of course they're not, they're within the ruins. They are probably um, adhering to something relatively crumbling. So uh, let's just see, can we pull these, can we pull these manacles out and take them with us? We'll stick with this table for now because I still can't find the rest of my tables. And um, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be somewhat possible that we'll do this. So we're going to get a plus one modifier to our three D6 um, rolls here and uh, see what we got. A two, we got a six, and we got a 10. And um, let's see, no we didn't, that's a, it's a 12. And I said a 13. So yes, we do, we got the manacles. We will add those manacles to our collection. And I think the water clock such as it is, I'm gonna just leave that as it, as it is. I'm not gonna try to interact with it or take it in any way. I'm not sure thematically how that makes sense for me. And um, again, you know, this is, um, you are the creator here, you, you decide and uh, I have decided we're just gonna basically ignore that uh, so we have we have in this first little spot here we have managed to find a flower that could have potentially attracted something deadly to us but that didn't actually happen and instead we discovered some manacles that had been bolted to a former wall but it was in ruin so we were easily able to take them and um, pocket them and now we're going to start to travel travel along here we are we are setting out from these uh these ruins in the middle of the forest where we found these manacles and to do that this is what we're doing we're doing this roll and i'll show you uh, what everything accounts for we have rolled for the direction we will be going in this direction that is this die here and we will be going eight hexes in that direction. So um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And that is going to land us in the desert here. That's the desert. And it took us eight hours to, to go that far. So we walked um, through, again, I'm not accounting for this, but if you wanted to just narrate this, you could do it however you wanted. Uh, we walked from the ruin in the forest through the mountains, trekked all the way to a desert area. We are out of supply here. We're sort of at the edge of the mountains, but we are clearly in the desert, and um, we will now mark down how much time we spent to get there. So you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We're in the desert basically at high, you know, slightly after high noon. Uh, we're right here in the middle of the day. It's going to be bright. It's going to be hot. And that is something, it has been a clear day. So that says to me, there's no clouds. There's the, the sun beating down on us. Now, I will say, uh, I will say a couple of things. I did not opt to have 
this be any particular type of season because uh, were it a season that could also affect the weather. I decided uh, not to do that because again it would just be something I probably would forget doing this on video. So um, we are just going with you know no seasonal impact and in this particular case I'm in the desert it's clear I'm going to say that it's hot because it's since I have a desert wilderness table here, I'm going to roll on it and just see if we can get any um, description of the desert map feature. Why not? So we'll do go back to our D100 and see what we get. We get an 80, and that is going to be ripples. Ripples can be as large as small dunes, but don't necessarily have the gentle slope, steep slope formation of a true dune. All right, well, that gives us gives us a little bit of a sense of something. And um, let's find out, let's see, should we, let's, uh, let's, let's roll on this dressing table, see if we get a little, little something there also. We rolled a two. We got some bones of a large animal, not to be, not unexpected here. And uh, let's see what the sand is like. The sand is, this uh, sand causes a risk of mutation, shape-shifting or physical change. All right, that may or may not come into play. And let's, um, let's do a little bit uh, more of desert dressing here, 57. Uh, there is, well, there's a spring or a small oasis. So that's, that's cool. I'm not going to count that toward our supply, but that gives us a little something. Now we go to our own, our self-constructed likelihood of encounter chart. We go down to desert. We see it's a 40% chance of some type of encounter. So let's see, are we going to have an encounter? We are not. We are no encounter here in the desert. So we're going to move on. And to move on, we go back to, back to our uh, rolling. Let's see where we're going and how long it's going to take us. We are going same direction and we're going to be moving five paces probably into the mountains. One, two, three, four, five. Indeed, we are in the mountains and it took us three hours to get there. So we are moving uh, the end of it's the end, end of the day, it's getting toward dusk, and we are in the mountains, and we can, if we choose to, roll up for a little more flavor about the mountain. All right, let's see, uh, let's see what we got. This is a hill addressing, but why not? 21, there's some carved rocks here. All right, well, that's gonna give us something to think about. So there's some carved rocks somewhere in our uh, line of sight, in our vision. And let's see if there's anything else here. And some fossils. Well, of course, we're seeing lots of uh, fossils. We already had mention of bone. That's to be expected. Let's see maybe what type of fossil. Uh, why not? We got a 51. And um, it's a human-sized. Oh, it's a head resembling a different type of creature. So there is, um, there's a carved rock. There's a head. Maybe there were some intelligent people who who lived here before. So this is what we've got. And um, now we can see if we get, we have a further directed encounter or if we want to investigate this carved rock. But uh, let's check on, first of all, the likelihood of the encounter in the mountains. It's going to be a 50% um, 50 chance. And indeed, uh, definitely here, we're going to have some type of encounter. So we need to go back to our chart and see exactly uh, what, what is going to be the nature of this encounter? So we're back to this encounter table here, another D100, and we'll give it a roll and see. We rolled a 66, which brings us to, again, features only. So this is telling me we need to investigate this, um, this carved rock, and um, we've got the mention of the fossils here, and we're going to take a look at that carved rock and see um, see what we can make of it. Before I get too far down the road of looking at the carved stone, the carved rock, and seeing what it might be, I want to take a moment and just pull back and look at the bigger picture here and talk about how um, I make some decisions at certain points in the adventure as it unfolds. Because what we've got here really is we've, we're getting in our die rolls a number of instances where the features of the environment are the things that we're meant to be investigating. We've gone through um, nine or so hours of the day. We've had a couple of um, event portions that happen, and yet we haven't had any direct creature encounter yet. 
And what we have had though is we have interacted with the environment. We got a an old manacle and we found out that the sand that we were in when we were in the desert portion was shape-shifting sand possibly uh, could have a risk of mutation and some sort of notion of physical change. And then we get to this carved rock and um, we see the fossil that could be human-sized and we also have mention of an oasis or a little spring. All this suggests to me that there was recent life here and more so than that, it suggests possibly that the manacle that we came upon had been perhaps holding someone who was imprisoned in the ruin, who escaped from the ruin, maybe someone who escaped through the ruin in the same path that we're traveling here and um, at his death, represented by the fossil, carved something into this rock and we have now um, come upon the rock and perhaps we are trying to understand what the rock is. And I think that there is the likelihood of there being a connection among all of these things is very high based on what the die rolls are directing us toward and based on the concept of a story that is unfolding and when the story gives you signals and signposts that seem to go together, it's easy to weave them together. So with all that said, um, I can simply say, I mean, there's two ways to do this really in your unfolding adventure. One, you could just simply say and narrate to yourself that indeed this carved rock is something written um, at the end of this person's life, the person who escaped the manacles that we now are holding. They made their way to this mountain. Maybe they were trying to get to the same place we're trying to get to. And uh, at the end of their life, they carved a message in this stone. You could simply decide all of that. Or if you wanted to, if you were following this line of thought, you could go back to some type of random chart that you could roll on and you could say, well, I think that all of this is the case. Um, what is the likelihood that that is the case? And then you could say, I think it is, um, it's very possible that um, all of this is the case. And you do your rolling here and you get a 9, 10, 11, 12. I won't mess it up here, 13, 14, 15. And indeed, yes, not only is that the case, but also something else. So um, we would be directed via this method also to pursue this line of inquiry. So this is one of the ways in which as the GM part of the adventuring party, the adventurer in this unfolding story, you need to take the reins and decide, make some narrative decisions about what's going to happen next. And the tables can help, but an over-reliance on the tables can lead you to um, just keep going back and forth. You get a yes or a no answer that there's not a lot to hang on a yes or no answer unless you have some story already in mind. So I feel that this is giving us all indications that this carved stone is something that um, is related to the fossil and it's related furthermore to the manacles that we already now have in our possession. And the question is, what does this stone say? Are we able to discern what this stone says? Now you'll notice we've gotten pretty far where we haven't even used the basic fantasy rules that we have. Um, we have all of our stats here. Here's our character sheet. I've been listing uh, what we're carrying, but we haven't had need to use any of the basic rules here. This is really the first time where I can go to a rule in basic fantasy and use it. And what that rule is, is the kind of general saving throw rule to um, succeed at something that isn't spelled out particularly in the rules. And I'll, I'll show you what that is. We're looking here at the saving throws rules in basic fantasy and what it is telling us here, these are the ability of a character to resist something, but I'm also using it. Um, here is a kind of catch-all that is the death ray. So it says that, um, you know, let's see, 
The saving throw versus death ray is often used as a catch-all save versus many of the ordinary dangers encountered in a dungeon environment. So the um, what we're going to do is we're going to use this rule because there isn't a difficulty number to overcome unless I'm missing it in the rules. So what we're going to do, and just to get in some of the basic fantasy rules, is we're going to roll um, and try to roll our death ray uh, a number to meet or exceed is 13. And we have a plus four bonus on our death ray or poison saving throw because we are a dwarf. So we're going to roll the d20 and try to get, uh, with our plus four bonus, try to meet or exceed a 13. And the question, what we're really trying to do here is see whether, and believe it or not, I don't have out, I don't even have the d20 out yet because that's how little we've actually used this rule set. Uh, what we are attempting to do is to determine um, whether we will be successful in uh, uh, reading, deciphering this, this writing on this rock, and then if we are, of course, the question is, well, what does it say? Finally, the first d20 of the game. So we're looking for a 13 or greater with a plus 4 modifier, and in fact, we got a 13 right with no modifier. So yes, we are going to figure out what it says. What does it say? We're going to lift up this stone. We're going to bring it to um, close to our body, and we are going to attempt to determine what it says. For this, I want to go truly as random as possible, and to do that, I'm choosing one of my all-time favorite books, my favorite books in general, and my favorite books for RPGing because it is just so evocative and descriptive and uh, fantastical yet grounded. So we're going to roll a random number in this book, and we're going to do that by using the uh, random.org random generator. The book here is paginated from 5 to 632, so we're going to just roll something on there, and we got 356. So we're going to turn to page 356 and just start reading, and whatever I get to first on 356 that sort of makes sense as something that could be written in rock, that is what it is going to be. And actually it uh, does happen to start at a uh, the beginning of a sentence. I would have just started at the beginning of a sentence anyway. But here, let me let me get rid of this so we can have a better lighting situation, maybe, here. <clears throat> and we begin. Emily, shuddering with emotions of horror and grief, assisted by Annette, prepared the corpse for internment. And having wrapped it in cerements and covered it with a winding sheet, they watched beside it till past midnight when they heard the approaching footsteps of the men who were to lay it in its earthly bed. It took a couple of pages of reading about a rather grim burial to get to this passage here that talks about um, somebody who is deeding over the rights to a state to someone else. And it says here, the law in the present instance gives me the estates in question, and my own hand shall never betray my right. That is what is etched on the stone. It is a last will and testament. We can see only a fragment of it, but we know now that the person who etched this, his wishes into the stone at the end of his life, at, on the brink of death, was asserting his rights to the land and um, making a bequest as well as a promise to never betray his rights to these lands, and yet he died somehow. How this factors into our story, I don't know, but we are going to decide to take this carving with us and carry it and bring it on our quest. It may be helpful to us as we continue the journey on toward our cleric. I've given it some thought, and actually, we're not going to take that rock. Our thief is a good thief and not somebody who would disturb the uh, remains of the dead or the marker of the dead. So what our thief has done is has written down what is on that 
rock and we're going to leave that rock in place. And the aside from it making sense from the point of view, if I'm really role playing the, this character as a good character, definitely would not do that. It also gives me a story point for perhaps the next segment of this adventure, which is there may be a reason that we have to get back to this rock. Perhaps our cleric knows something about this rock that we don't or can elicit some magical energy or something from this rock. The um, There are rules for getting lost. I have not been playing with those rules. We've just been wandering around um, without a particular point in mind. But if I have this as an anchor in the story, it will give me, as I said, a potential another story point, another narrative to create, to get back to it, in which we could factor in, you know, how we get back to it, are we getting lost, etc. So for both, um, <coughs> for both narrative structural reasons and for the role-playing aspect of my character, it doesn't make sense for me to take the rock. So it will be left there. And now we're going to move on from this mountain area. We'll go back to our um, rolling of the uh, three dice to indicate where we're going and um, how long it's going to take to, to get there. And we're rolling what we got a six, which is um, the uh, northeasterly direction, sort of back the way we came, five paces. And uh, it's only going to take us two hours to do that. So we're moving one, two, three, four, five. And this is a good time to note, again, what I said and talked about in the other video. The map here is meant simply to suggest terrain. It is not meant to suggest actual location. So it's basically terrain and time. The fact that I ended up on this same hex that I was on earlier back in the desert does not mean I'm actually in the same place. So um, hopefully that will be clear to you, but I have been wandering now and I am have wandered into another area of the desert. We have spent two hours to do that. So it is now um, beginning to be nighttime and is going to start to get cold in that desert. And the next point that we need to do is to, um, well, we're still not in any kind of supply and we're going to roll for our chance of an encounter in the desert. I don't remember offhand what that is. We got a 40% chance of an encounter here, so let us see uh, whether that's going to happen. And indeed, it is going to happen. So we're going to have some type of desert encounter, and now we'll go to see what type that might be. We're back here on the encounter uh, chart. I'll just pull this to the side. We'll give that a roll. And we got a 95, which is uh, nothing. So we will continue on. We just expended some time wandering around and see where we go next. All right, we are moving north just one We're still in the desert but this time it took us three hours to get there so night is falling we're going to be marking this uh, one two three we're nearing sort of the end well we're getting in deep into night and again we're going to see check to see if there is an encounter and there is not so we will continue on and we are moving south now eight paces. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We're back into clear. We are right near a road. Not quite, but we're right near a road. It only took us an hour to get there. Still, it is dark. It is really, it's nighttime at this point. So we are in the clear. Not, not a great likelihood of an encounter there. And indeed, no. So continue along. Oops. We were here, 
And now we are moving in this direction, three paces, one, two, three. I think that's where we are, one, two. I lost track of where we are. Yeah, that's where we are. I mean, obviously, it's. <laughs> I should have stated this, but obviously, I'm using something with a base that is not not meant at all for this map, but I just, I used it because it's the closest thing I had to the guy I envisioned. I don't have a ton of minis, but it's, it's suboptimal, clearly. In any case, that took us three hours. We're deep into the night here, and we are into the mountains. We're in the mountains at night, and um, we will see, yes, hmm, exactly, we are going to have an encounter. So check out this back to this encounter table i'll just do this rolling over here and that was a 57 which is going to be features only really really interesting guys because i want to uh this video is getting long and of course i want to show you some basic combat but may not be the case because i keep rolling on features only and again what this is suggesting to me as i said earlier is that i need to be paying attention to the um not only to the environment to but to anything that sticks out in the environment that i may have found so let's see where in the mountains we are and what we might find it feels as if a little bit we're at this blank kind of spot right now where we've been traveling around, we haven't had a clear signal for a new encounter or anything. And sometimes when that happens, I will turn to something new that I haven't pri previously used in the adventure. And in this case, it's this hazards table from the Warhammer Crest Quest role play book that I mentioned earlier. So the way this works is, and I don't know if, whether we're going to get something at work because not everything is going to map. Obviously, it's a totally different system, and not everything is even wilderness-based, but some of it was, so we'll see. Uh, it works with two D6s. You've got one in the tens in the one spot, and uh, we will see. We rolled a 41, and we will see what that is. 41, lost. Well, ha, all right, we are lost. After a few days' travel, the warriors admit to themselves that they are absolutely lost. They are about to give up the journey completely when they notice smoke curling into the sky a few miles away. A couple of hours later, the warriors discover the source of the smoke, a small village not marked on their map. Here they are told that the nearest town is another six weeks' travel. The warriors can either carry on to the town or end their journey now and see what they can buy here. All right. This is actually something that we can use uh, from a narrative perspective. What is suggested here is it says that in a couple of hours, we uh, can discover the source of the smoke and get to a small village. So it's the middle of the night. I'm bringing you back into our time track here. It's really um, almost toward dawn. So I'm going to spend that couple of hours that is suggested to us by this. And um, we will be finding ourselves in... Uh, let's see, it was described as a, uh, a small village not marked on the map. So here we are, and we are in, I guess we are in the desert here. And it makes somewhat sense the, that there could be a small village here because we were really right near some road or pathway. And so somewhere here, after a couple of hours travel, uh, we find ourselves in a small village. And I uh, will indicate... Let's see, how am I going to do this? Well, we'll just roll for, we, we spent a couple of hours, so I'm going to say we're going to roll just to sort of give us a locale for this. Um, we will be going back in this direction 10 spots. I think we were here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Well, <laughs> interesting. We're in the middle of a river. There's a small encampment on this river. It has not been, it is not marked on the map. We have found it and we are now going to interact with this village in some way. The first question I'm going to ask here is what is the likelihood that uh, I'm going to find somebody to interact with here? And for this, I'm going to go to the uh, this is a table from 
iron sworn. That is a, just a different way of having an odds table. I'm going to say it's almost certain there's going to be somebody in this village. And the reason that I'm going here is because I like this little twist. It says on a match, meaning the actual number here an extreme result or twist has occurred. So should I um, happen to roll an 11, um, something extraordinary will happen. I, I like the, the possibility of that. But so we're going to say, are we, is there going to be somebody here that we can talk to, an NPC? Uh, I'm going to say it's almost certain because it's a village, but um, let's give it a roll and see that um, indeed there is, we didn't get the exact match, but indeed there's a strong uh, sense of yes, there's going to be an NPC here. So I'm going to go to my NPC table that comes from a basic fantasy supplement and I'll show you here. These are pre-generated characters. I have uh, marked them up so they work out on a d12 roll as to who it is. I had to eliminate one of them to make that work, but um, too bad for the Halfling male fighter, I ditched him, and I will be rolling a d12 that I think I need to retrieve to see who it is that's wandering around this village. All right, here's my d12 roll. It's 10, and who it is is Katie Jones. She is a human female magic user. Here are her stats. She's got two times daggers, and now... I would like to determine whether or not she is a friendly, friendly person or not a friendly person. The way this works in basic fantasy is you are going to be rolling uh, on this monster reaction table and the to see what the what the reaction of the monster is. And in this case, it's an NPC, but I'm just an enemy. Unfortunately, what we need to do is, so we roll our 2d6 and we add the charisma bonus of our lead character. Well, in that case, that's just us. And we, our charisma bonus is a minus one. We're a dwarf thief. Well, you know, we're not, not the most uh, charismatic guy there. And so we are going to have to subtract one from our roll to see what we get. So if we're not rolling pretty high, we're going to have some unfavorable interaction, perhaps even a combat with this uh, Katie, whatever her name was. Oh, sorry. So let's get these two d6s and see what we get. We rolled a seven. That's not going to be good. So that's coming down to a six. So we are at an unfavorable, at the low end of... Um, well, I guess at the high end of unfavorable. So it's not an immediate attack, but she is not so predisposed toward us. And now we need to figure out, let's just take a look at her. She's got a couple of daggers. So we see this Katie Jones. She is um, wary of us. And we see her standing there with her hands at her sides, ready to take those daggers out of the hilt. She's kind of in a semi-aggressive stance, but not charging us immediately. And what do we do? Well, I'm thinking to myself, what I've got here, I've got this holy symbol, this pointed headdress that I am guarding with my life, literally. And I've got these manacles that I've picked up. I have some rations. I've got my own battle axe and short bow, but I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be pulling those out. I think what I am going to do is to, um, approach her slowly and, um, attempt to, attempt to gain some information from her and, I'm going to ask her if she knows of this cleric. Is this cleric nearby? Um, is she familiar with this cleric? And I'm going to give, um, I'm going to go to this oracle chart right here for this. And I'm going to say that um, it's just completely unknown to us um, whether or not she knows this, knows the cleric. We're going to roll our d20 and see um, what we get with that roll. And uh, once again, I cannot find that d20. So um, we have no idea if she can help us or not. Or not. It's just basically a 50-50 chance. We rolled a 17. So yes, yes, she does know the cleric. 
she does know this cleric and um, we at this point are feeling perhaps a little more a little less wary because we have talked to her she's indicated she knows the cleric there's a slight she seems to be slightly relaxing um, into the conversation and we are going to show her we're going to take a risk and we're going to show her our holy symbol we're going to explain to her that we are on a journey to take this holy symbol to the cleric and we are going to see um, ask for her help we're going to solicit her help and see whether or not she um, will help us the question really is, um, is she, is it still unknown that she'll help us? Is it likely? Is it unlikely? And this is where, uh, you know, again, this is, you're directing the story here. I want it to be, I want it to be slightly more likely that she'll help us because I want this to go somewhere. So, um, we're going to say it's likely that she'll help us. She, she admitted to knowing the cleric and, um, we've shown her, some connection to the cleric. So I'm going to say it's not very likely, but I'm going to say it is likely. And we'll go again with this uh, rolling here with the d20 and see what we get. We got a 10. And the 10 on the likely is yes, she's going to help us, but it's not going to be that easy. And how it's not going to be that easy is she is going to whip around and tell us that we need to overcome a challenge that she's going to present to us to indicate our willingness, our stamina, our ability, our strength, our dexterity to be her companion, to take us to the cleric, or at least to help us get to the cleric. And what is that going to be? It's going to be a minor challenge where we have to do some minor combat with a minor enemy. Why? Well, the reason why, frankly, is because this video is getting long and I've gone all this way with no combat and I'd like to show you at least one combat, how that would be worked out and then um, probably call it a day and a wrap on this, uh, on this video. So we're going to figure out now uh, where to get the appropriate creature. I did not plan for this in terms of how I set up my own uh, creature table, so I'll need to give that a moment off camera and uh, figure that out. Remember, it is it is nighttime here. Uh, dawn is a couple of hours away, and out of the darkness, we see that Katie has summoned a wolf. It is the lone wolf. It is a wolf who is her traveling companion, and he is going to be the challenge that we need to face here to see how how worthy we are of um, engaging her services. The first thing we need to do is figure out how far away is this wolf from us? What, uh, what, what are we dealing with here? So I'm um, going to this table here and we are in the same place. So we're going to be rolling two D4s to determine the distance away. So here's our two D4s, we give them a toss. We got a two and a one, that's a three. So they're within melee range. And um, we are carrying, we have, um, let's see, what weapons do we have? Well, a couple points actually about us to start. We have a, um, both a battle axe and a short bow. What we don't have is are any modifiers to our um, attack at all because we are a very low level character we don't have a lot of um, we don't have a lot of anything really in terms of stats and the thing you'll notice right here I don't even have any hit points indicated here I haven't rolled for that yet and I wanted to do that on camera so I could explain to you how I am going to be modifying this rule set the uh, the usual role for our level one dwarf would be a 1d4 hit points. I'm going to do that, but then I'm going to multiply whatever I get by four. Why? Well, um, I'm traveling alone, but I'm trying to simulate as if I was traveling with a party of four adventurers. So um, we're going to just do our, our hit points here, and then we'll also see what we're dealing with um, with the with the wolf there. So well, that came off camera. That was a four. You'll have to believe me on that. I'll do the roll again on camera so you can actually see it. Although that really was a four. Um, I can't seem to get it on camera. 
Oh, three. All right, we'll go with twelve. So um, we're gonna we're gonna come in with twelve hit points, and the uh, the stats on the wolf the. Monsters in basic fantasy roll, at least most of them, I think all of them, are going to be rolling a d8 for their hit points. And the wolf is, um, he's got two hit dice, so we're going to do a 2d8 roll to see how strong he is. All right, here we go. It's my 2d8s for the uh, hit points of the wolf. Let's try to keep this on, on camera. Oh, great. <laughs> That was pretty good. All right, he's only got uh, he's only got two hit points. You saw it here, folks. So uh, that's pretty good. And um, well, perhaps it makes sense. Perhaps he is. Perhaps he's a runt. Perhaps he was taken in by Katie. Maybe she's a good. Maybe she's a good uh, good person. A good magic user who took this um, wolf in. Who was. Um, maybe abandoned by the rest of the pack because he or she was too weak. And, um, and now it is up to us to engage with this wolf and see, and see how we deal with that. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to roll for initiative and see who is going first. We're going to be represented by the blue die and um, we have the initiative here. So what we're going to do, we're within melee range of this. We're going to take our um, our battle axe is going to be doing the, the larger damage that does 1d8 damage. We're going to basically charge at this wolf. Again, we have no modifiers to our attack at all, unfortunately, at this stage. So we're simply going to be rolling and um, our uh, the AC of the wolf is 13 and um, we're going to be just hoping to um, get a, a unmodified roll as a 13 or greater to land some damage here on this wolf as we as we charge ahead. Now, uh, mind you, it is in the darkness, so um, that could potentially impact things, and we roll, well, we roll a 15. So we rush at this wolf, we land um, a uh, blow with our battle axe doing 1d8 worth of damage, and let's see how effective we were in um, damaging him. We were pretty effective. So with just a, just a one big stab, we have um, detained the wolf. Let's say that this wolf, unbeknownst to us, is a magic wolf. This wolf is not going to die, and Katie is somewhat stricken at the ferocious nature of our response to her challenge, how we rose up and, um, without hesitation, went for the jugular of her companion. And this is something she is not going to allow to happen. So she puts a stop to this combat and um, rushes forward, cradles the wolf in her arms, and with an intake of breath and a conjuring motion with her arms up out of the dirt, she patches the wolf's wound and he rises to his feet again and stands by her side. Through the darkness, you can see her looking at you with something that seems almost like awe. She reaches into her cloak and pulls out a crystal. Slowly, she approaches and hands it to you and asks you to take out the headdress that she sees in your pocket. You pull it out and notice that one of the crystal spots in it is missing. You take the crystal from her, place it in the headdress, look her in the eyes, and she says, yes, together we will find the cleric now. I have been searching for him my whole life. He is my father. 